How's it going, everybody? Brian Alvarez here on Wrestling Observer Live. We are here every day, Monday through Friday, noon Pacific, 3 Eastern, Sunday, 3 Pacific, 6 Eastern, Saturday mornings with Jim Valley, 10 a.m. Pacific, 1 Eastern, Sundays with Andrew Zarian. And yes, it is Wednesday here on the show, and you know what that means? We got a lot to talk about. We got Dynamite tonight. A lot of stuff announced for the show. We're going to go over the full lineup for Dynamite here tonight. Last night, of course, was NXT. I got a correction from yesterday, because I can't keep track of anything at this point. The Halloween Havoc show is a pay-per-view, a PLE, Sunday on Peacock. And so we will be covering that on Sunday for the Brian and Vinny show and Wrestling Observer Radio. And then there is another show the following Tuesday. And then Wednesday, it's Fright Night Dynamite. So... There's a lot of stuff going on, and because the WWE pay-per-view is coming up in Saudi Arabia, they're not doing back-to-back. So we got a WWE pay-per-view this weekend and a WWE pay-per-view next weekend, and everything else as well. So we'll talk about that, the Dynamite lineup for tonight, and all of the news, including the latest on the Kung Lee lawsuit that we've been talking about a lot on the Wrestling Observer Radio Show. The judge had initially denied the settlement that had been uh, basically both sides had agreed to this settlement. And the judge was like, not happening. So a new settlement was uh, suggested. And uh, this time, Richard Bulwer, he did give preliminary approval. What does this mean for a fellow like Filthy Tom Lawler? Well, we'll tell you about that. Plus all of the news in wrestling, Adam Cole, Bobby Lashley, holograms, injury, ratings, And, of course, at the end of the show, the NXT TV report. A lot to get into here today. Text us, 425-780-7566. That is 425-780-7566. Brian at WrestlingObserver.com. F4WOnline at gmail.com. F4WOnline threads, Instagram, and Cameo. You can find me at Brian Elvers on Twitter. Back in a moment, Observer Live. Back right in the show, Brian Alvarez here, Wrestling Observer Live. Mike Simbervivi, also of WrestlingObserver.com. We got a lot to talk about today. And before we get into it, just want to point out this show today is free. And if you enjoy this show, well, we have the option to subscribe and get 84-odd shows every month. That's a lot of content. 84 hours or more of content every month, just $9.99. And there's a million ways to do it. We've got Apple Podcasts. You can find our area, f4wonline.com slash apple. You can find us on Spotify. Go to f4wonline.com slash Spotify or YouTube. You can watch the videos in beautiful HD, f4wonline.com slash YouTube. So check any of those out, $9.99 a month, and you get anywhere from two to three new full-length podcasts every day. 84 shows a month for $9.99. So... Get them downloaded to your phone or watch them every night at 4wonline.com slash Apple, at 4wonline.com slash Spotify, at 4wonline.com slash YouTube. Any of those options, $9.99. Or you can sign up for the main the main site. You not only get the podcast, but also the archives. Somebody actually added it up. It's over 15,000 shows in the archives now. That's up at WrestlingObserver.com. You also get the Observer newsletter and more. So if you like this show, sign up, everybody, and uh, you won't regret it as you drive to your job stuck in traffic, and you can listen to me talk about Paul Ellering in 1981 when he was cosplaying superstar Billy Graham. Man. Anyway, we got a lot to talk about here today. Another lawsuit has been filed against WWE Vince McMahon, Linda McMahon, and TKO Group Holdings today on behalf of five survivors of the Ring Boy scandal. Been a while since we had a new lawsuit filed against Vince. Lawsuit alleges that WWE was aware of and did nothing to stop Ring announcer and Ring crew chief Mel Phillips' sexual abuse of underage boys on the Ring crew. States that Phillips targeted children from broken homes Assaults occurred not only at wrestling events, but also in hotel rooms, other locations where Phillips would have the boys shuttled. Allegations became public 
1992 were covered on shows such as A Current Affair and Donahue. Lawsuit also states that the five survivors named John Doe's one through five in the suit only recently learned of the depth of knowledge the McMahons and WWE had about their abuse. As a result of new insights gained from the lawsuit, Janelle Grant fired, uh, filed in January. Greg Gutzler, who is leading the litigation, says, Thanks to the bravery of our clients, we finally have a chance to hold accountable those who allowed and enabled the open, rampant sexual abuse of these young boys. That so many were aware of the sexual abuse of the Ring Boys did nothing to prevent or stop it is simply unconscionable. WWE and the McMahons had a responsibility to these underage boys. They failed them in the worst way possible. We will vigorously fight to uncover the truth about this systemic, insidious, life-altering abuse. And I believe no response from WWE or Vince or anybody involved yet. But uh, that's the latest. Another one coming out. And a lot of uh, individuals uh, targeted as well. WWE, Vince, Linda, and TKO. Well, Linda was the what president at the time of, of Titan Sports. I'm not sure exactly what her position was exactly. But it'll be interesting to see what new information is out there and how they are going to go about approaching this case. Mel Phillips and then the people that were also tied into this after the fact, Terry Garvin, Pat Patterson, have all passed away at this point. So it will be interesting to see what is brought along here and what angle is going to be played to, you know, when it comes to the plaintiffs in this case. We also had another lawsuit that has been uh, settled preliminary approval so our own filthy tom lawler was part of this it was the kung lee lawsuit on tuesday nevada federal judge richard bulware gave his preliminary approval 375 million dollar settlement giving a lifeline of sorts for hundreds of former ufc fighters desperately in need of money next step following formal approval is for the ufc to actually pay the money into an escrow account and for the Lee team to then re uh, disperse the remaining funds after recovering their fees. Fees are expected to be $115 million, cannot be more than 33% of the total award. So essentially what happened here is um, this was a lawsuit filed against uh, you know UFC and TKO, underpaying the fighters, and there had been a preliminary uh, settlement amount of $335 million that would be spread out amongst these fighters. And judge, like, both sides agreed to this settlement, okay? Both sides agreed. They go to the judge. The judge says, nah, I ain't approving that. Not enough. So, like, everybody involved was like, what? Because, quite frankly, I mean, we talked about this a long time ago. It was either going to be a settlement or it was going to go to court, Okay. And both sides were concerned about it going to court because the fact of the matter is, you know, as far as like how much should you pay the fighters, what percentage of profits do you pay the fighters? It's not like there's a law. You know, the fighters signed an agreement and the UFC paid the money to the fighters. Was it, was it morally right or wrong what they paid? The issue is, was it legal what they did? And, you know, the feeling was we could go to court and uh, it could be determined that, yeah, it was legal. And then nobody gets anything, including the lawyers who worked 10 years on this suit. So pretty much all sides were like, let's not risk this. Let's just settle. And then the judge comes along and goes, nope, I'd rather see this thing go to court. And then both sides were like, oh, my God, we could end up with nothing. So they they uh, they offered a three hundred and seventy five million dollar from three thirty five, and uh, this time, you know, all of the fighters were like, you know, people from both sides are basically begging this judge, please agree to this settlement. Like all of us agree to this, we're fine with it. Like we don't want to go. So finally, the judge uh, he did his um, preliminary approval. So basically, um, thirty five class members would net over a million. 100 would net over 500,000, more than 200 would recover over 250,000, and uh, 500 would 
uh, net in excess of 100,000. Nearly 800 will recover over 50,000. So a person like Tom, uh, based on the number of fights that he had, he's probably looking at like 100, 150,000, 175,000, somewhere around there. We'll get him on the show, see if he wants to talk about it. But, you know, he's going to be making six figures off of this. So uh, a lot of fighters are going to make a lot of money. Of course, the fighters that probably need it the most are not going to make the most. You know, we're talking guys like Brock Lesnar, who's, I mean, God only knows how much that guy's worth. Like, I can't even tell you. I mean, he's worth a lot. He's going to get several million. You know, Ronda Rousey's going to get several million. George St. Pierre, guys like that. You know, the low-level fighters who are really looking for money. I mean, they're not going to get millions, but they'll get something. So it looks like everybody is uh, is happy with how this turned out. Well, if you're entitled to it, you're entitled to it. It's like your Social Security. You work all your life for it. Sure, you've saved up enough where you maybe you don't need Social Security. But guess what? I've been paying into that my entire working life. Give me my money. And in this case, when it comes to these fighters, I don't know if people realize how much fighters have to put out for their camps for bringing in sparring partners, all that sort of stuff. You know, yeah, they would get X amount of dollars that you would see listed, but then they had a bunch of expenses that they had to pay out. And it's not like they've been living great. And that's always been the case when it comes to fighters, boxing in the mixed martial arts. There really is only one answer to this, which is unionizing and getting some sort of collective bargaining, because that's the only way you really help yourself and your fellow athletes. But we know that's never going to happen. All right, more news after the break. Observer Live. One other thing that should be noted about the lawsuit, the Kung Lee lawsuit, is that this was the period between December 16, 2010, June 30, 2017. And there is a, another Kajan Johnson versus UFC antitrust case with a different time frame. and also includes fighters that they, when they signed their deals, had to agree they would not be part of a class action lawsuit. They're now part of a class action lawsuit, so we'll see what happens with that one. But the point is, of this uh, $375 million, the Kung Lee suit covers like 1,200 fighters, but you know some of them could have opted out. I don't think that's going to happen. But now that the agreement has, has been made, or the preliminary agreement... All of these fighters need to basically provide information on your address, blah, blah, blah. So if many of them don't, that money still gets paid out to the remaining fighters. So if it's $260 million going out to 100% of the fighters, if only 80% confirm their address and everything, that $260 million is now going to be dispersed among the remaining 80%. So whatever their estimate is... Uh, it likely is going to be end up being a little bit larger uh, than they've estimated now because there probably will be people. I know it sounds ridiculous that some people won't confirm their address and stuff, but you know things happen, and it'll probably be a little little higher than that. Not not substantially, but that's how it's, it's possible being worked that out. fighters have passed away in that time too. Who may have originally been on the lawsuit, and the only thing I know is lawyers are going to get about thirty percent of that. So, all right, uh, tonight is dynamite. Actually, no, that's that's non. It's 375, and the lawyers are going to get 115. So the 260 is being dispersed amongst the fighters. And uh, that's a lot of money. A lot of money going to a lot of people. Tonight is Dynamite. We have got John Moxley appears, which means he's going to kill some people. Mark Risco and Chris Jericho, ladder war for the Ring of Honor title. The Elite versus Daniel Garcia and Private Party. We got Sammy Guevara versus Shelton Benjamin, Camille versus Queen Aminata, House of Black in action. Hook is going to confront Taz's attackers, and we will hear from Kyle Fletcher. So we got a full we got a full lineup. I wonder if they've sold any tickets since. Let's see if I can find that. I talked about this yesterday. They've had a they've had a card well in advance. Let's see if we've got an update today. Let's see. Does not look like it. May not do it until, until right before the show. I think he may wait till the last minute on days like this. But again, that this show and then the one collision coming up here on Saturday in Cedar Rapids would be interesting to see if they were able to spike any 
ticket sales for that show as well too although i'm not sure what exactly they have announced so far for that i know they have one match announced for rampage that's being taped tonight yeah i don't see anything for collision i may have missed something but yeah rampage undisputed kingdom versus the gates of agony in a three-way with uh shane taylor promotions so that's what we know about uh about rampage Did they announce anything for collision I know they've been announcing a lot of matches. We've got like, you know, all everything tonight. Something for Rampage. So, two Halloween. things. Two things for the Halloween uh, yeah. edition of the show. But uh, so I don't think they have said anything about Collision that I think about. It. I'm really not sure. Why have they not announced anything for Collision with the show doing this poorly? I don't know. Like, what's happening? And if there's anybody, and I'm dead serious about this, if there's anybody in Iowa that is you know, watching their local news or anything like that. I'm interested to know if there's been any promotion. Have there been inserts onto WWE shows with, you know, saying the tickets are available for AEW or anything like that? Interested to know if they've done any blitzing at all here in the last couple of days. All right. Well, if I hear anything in the next uh, half hour, I'll start to plug it. But yes, yeah, Cedar Rapids. And granted, our last update was almost a week ago, but it was 952 tickets. So, And what size building is that, too? Because I honestly I have no idea what building they're in. Well, it, it's, it's, set up for, it's set up for 1,600. I'm not sure. I could try and find what the uh, capacity is. Because at the is. very least, the smaller the building, and in that case, hopefully, the shorter the ceiling... You know, that does help affect the crowd noise, which is always muted for multiple reasons at AEW shows. Okay, the capacity of this building is 9,000. The well, Alliant Energy Powerhouse. Uh, Hobbs better be back for that show this Saturday. Because he's Powerhouse Hobbs. Wait, where's, let's see, Iowa's in Ames, Iowa, University of Iowa. Is it? Would that be Iowa State in Cedar Rapids? Producer Dom, can you check on that? This is, that is their Cedar home Rapids, Iowa, in downtown Cedar Rapids. That's where this, this show Probably is beautiful this place. time of year. Yes. Back Nothing for plane. collision yet. <laughs> That's what I've been told here on the chat. They sold Iowa State nine... is also Ames. Okay. Oh, it's Iowa State is Ames? So where, where's the University of Iowa then? Iowa City. It's not Iowa City, is it? Yes. Maybe. You're, you're questioning my geographical knowledge. Well, I know. You were a big fan of Big E when he played football there. He yeah, sure was, man. Okay. Um, what else do we have here? I actually spent some time on this. Did you guys watch NXT last night? Yes. You did? I did. Can you believe? What Carlito said? Yeah, no, it's no. crazy. Oh. Can you believe that the Javon Evans character is now me? They're stealing bits from this show, and I'm Nathan Frazier, I think. He literally I is now Brian Alvarez. Like, I could not believe this segment they did. <laughs> Good luck with your career, buddy. So they're backstage. It's Cedric and Javon, okay? Tell me if this sounds familiar, everybody, okay? Cedric and Javon are backstage, and Axiom and Nathan Frazier walk up. And Axiom says to Javon Evans, Hey, congratulations, man. You had back-to-back -back main events. You didn't win, but you were close. You're going to get there. And Nathan Frazier says to him, You're young. You've got time. And now Javon is like, he's furious. And he goes, dude, I am so sick of people telling me that I'm young and I've got time. And Frazier says, don't worry, you're going to win the big one eventually. It'll be a while, but you'll win that big one eventually. Get used to it, kid. I had to deal with all that when I was your age. Now Javon can take no more, slaps a dude across the face, storms off, and then Javon Alvarez runs into Wesley, who says... Look, hate's going to come at you from all directions, but don't worry. You got time for all that. Now Javon's furious. I'm like, my God. Like, it's me now. It's me and the rest of these idiots are the NXT writing team that have been telling me, oh, don't worry, he's all right. He's okay, he's young. I can't believe this. All those years that you grew up 
imitating and wanting to be the heartbreak kid, Shawn Michaels, so bad. And now he's stealing all your material to put on NXT, on the CW, on national TV every single week. Hey, listen, I'll, I'll be Javon's spirit animal. Oh, my God. I'll, I'll wave the flag. Whatever it gonna, takes. Come you're on. Gonna be, you going to be bouncy? Don't worry about Javon. He'll be fine. He's God, he's as, he's as sick of that as I am. Sick of it. It's true. Both of us. So anyway, now, I can't even believe I may complain about this. Now, they've announced that Javon and Cedric are getting a tag team title shot next week. Uh, you it's hate like Cedric. that's what we're gonna do to See, like make all this better. Go. He's gonna Javon be and Cedric are gonna win he, the tag titles with a week's a build. God, gonna be a champion, but it's with Cedric, so it is beneath him. They are still killing this kid. He's got no more. Nah, time. the point is, any, it's almost over. any nerd can win the tag team titles. Like whatever, who cares? He'll get his belt. You know, Nick Wayne won the tag titles. That went a long way, by the way. You know, and then somebody else. You ever you ever gone and look at some of the the videos what, again? The, the GCW tag title. Listen, have Jordan you ever Oliver carried them? Have you ever gone on YouTube and looked at some of the videos that get put up, and then look at the comments on them? It's like, I mean, we got to do it and everything like that, but you can just see like there's so many people that don't. They only watch like the short YouTube videos. So there was like a video up there where I was like complaining about Javon and how they just are wasting him and he's just doing whatever and he's a jobber and everything. And then, you know, there's all these people in the comments going, gee, I wonder if he had the same energy regarding Nick Wayne. Well, actually, yeah. You just don't listen to those shows. God, it's just as bad. It's actually, you know what? It's actually worse with Nick Wayne because Javon's actually had like matches. I mean, how many matches has Nick Wayne had in AEW? 13 since he turned 18 or whatever. And then he wins the, uh, he won the, he was one third of the trios titles for like a week. And then they just took him off him again. It's like, yes, I have in fact had the same energy for Nick Wayne. I'm sorry if you don't listen to that show. Smarten up and listen to it before you do a stupid comment. You geeks. Why, why do you say you have to do that? You don't have to do that. You can have to do what? Comment. You can close the comment section instead of letting all the vermin in and just spew no. nonsense. It would be one thing if you actually got some intelligent commentary well, in sometimes there all you about do. any really when yeah, sometimes pointed you out do. ever. You know, like I'll a, let you do I'll let you do the research. I, I had that uh that post where I was like, you know, AEW needs to like promote more. <laughs> they need to not book for the sickos or whatever. And there were a lot of people that were like, you know the guy's right. Let's promote our our wrestling shows, you know? Promote them. Anyway, we'll do some more news after the break. Then I'll talk about this NXT on CW. Back in a moment, Observer Live. Adam Cole did an interview with Sports Illustrated. He said that he injured his leg so badly, the doctors had to put a cadaver bone in his leg. First piece of news that I heard was, your ankle is way worse than we anticipated. You have to get another surgery in seven days. So not only did I have to get double the amount of screws in my ankle, also I had to get someone else's bone put into my ankle because the bone piece within my ankle just completely disintegrated. Incredibly thankful to the donor and the family. Certainly a better option. Definitely knows the difference in my left ankle as opposed to my right one. I think that comes with the territory. He was out for a year and finally able to come back. Increase the vitamin D. Brutal. Brutal. Yeah. Also, Hologram is injured, which explains the random angle they had at Battle of the Belts where Roosh, Drillistico, and the Beast Mortos all beat him up backstage and tried to take his mask off. So apparently he got hurt at that uh, Wrestle Dream uh, best of three falls match with Mortos. Don't have any idea the severity of the injury, but apparently it'll be a few weeks, so hopefully that means nothing too serious. And then Raw on Monday night, 1.58 million viewers, 0.51 in 18 to 49. They tied with The Voice as the highest rated show in 18 to 49 outside of obviously the NFL. They faced uh, a lot of competition. Ravens versus the Buccaneers. 16 million viewers and a 4.71 in 18 to 49. The kids love Lamar. Yeah. You know what's funny is, um, by the way, it's 1.61 million viewers and 1.55 million viewers. 
Lenny hasn't been around for a while, but you ever notice it like when you when you go over these ratings here, and let's say you're a big fan of AEW, and you talk about how you know this Rampage show did the lowest number ever for a Rampage, the lowest eighteen to forty nine. Like it, 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 it uh, we're talking shows that were preempted, different. Like it never did a lower eighteen. To, and then they go, ah, I don't care about these numbers. Doesn't matter to me. I just want to watch a show. Well, first off, you can't watch Rampage anymore after the end of this year because it got canceled. So you can't watch it anymore. Probably would have not been canceled if it had done better. But the other thing they go is, only in wrestling do people talk about ratings. I just want to mention that um, I do another non-wrestling show for subscribers. It's called After Dark Radio. We talk about Bigfoot and paranormal activities and ufos got a guy coming on this thursday to talk about exorcisms and you can listen to this show by the way as part of a subscription on spotify apple podcasts or youtube at 4wonline.com slash spotify at 4wonline.com slash apple at 4wonline.com slash youtube any of these work 9.99 a month but anyway the point is so i had a guy on talking about the paranormal and, you know, ghost hunting. You ever watch those ghost hunting shows? And I said, uh, like, you know, you, this guy actually had a degree. He, he had, a, he had a, a, a master's degree in parapsychology. And he runs experiments and such. And I said, like, what do you see on these shows that is, like, good or bad? You know, how are these shows? And he goes, I don't like these shows. Because essentially, the ghost hunting shows... There's like a right way to look for ghosts, apparently. But there's also what the the producers of the show want. And he goes, you know, they always want you to look for ghosts in the dark. Like you go to a cemetery or you go to a spooky house in the middle of the night in the dark and you look through the thing with your fleer and everything. He goes, we get, you know, people report ghosts and hauntings and everything. He goes, these things almost never happen at night in the dark. Like, almost nobody is in the dark, and they see a ghost. They always see a ghost, like, you know, they're walking through the thing, walking through Sistine Chapel or whatever, and 3 o'clock in the afternoon, and there's... He goes, it never happens in the dark. But, like, these producers, they want to get great ratings, he says. They say, well, turn off the lights, it's spookier. Or, hey, go to the grave... He goes, you know how many people report ghosts in a graveyard? Like, nobody. Nobody ever reports a ghost in a graveyard. But they, the producers, because they want to draw big ratings, well, they want you to go to the uh, the graveyard. So anyway, the point of this is everybody is concerned about ratings. It isn't something where wrestling fans or whatever, it's like everybody's concerned about it. If you're a fan of the ghost hunting shows, you want your show to do a good number so it doesn't get canceled. Anyway. So don't turn off the lights when you're looking for ghosts, you idiots. Leave the lights on. Maybe you'll see them. We had Kyrie Sane and Io Sky versus Jakara Jackson and Lash Legend. Not a great match. It was very clear Jakara and Lash should be in development a little longer. They weren't, like, terrible, but you could see, like, this was not a main roster caliber match. There were a lot of botched spots, a lot of people out of position. And then finally, the, the match, I mean, despite all that, it was, like, getting pretty good. And then Piper Niven showed up and tripped Jakara for the DQ atrocious finish it's like i don't even know what these people have to do with anything why are chelsea and piper attacking jakara and like did i miss something on smackdown so this sucked and then uh the saving grace was they did go nuts for piper and chelsea because they're from the main roster we had a segment correct me if i'm wrong here okay hank and tank are doing a rally and otm shows up and i'm gonna mute myself here OTM walks up and they go, what the? Like, totally dropped an F-bomb right on the CW. And they didn't bleep it or anything. I was like, okay. They challenged uh, these guys to a match for later on. We had uh, Jada Parker and Tatum Paxley. My prayers were answered. And Jada beat her. Fortunately, she didn't break any of her toys. I was hoping that would happen too. But then, in a scene that I have not seen since... World Championship Wrestling in the 90s. And yes, this is a direct comparison to WCW. 
after the match, Wendy Chu showed up, and she put Tatum Paxley in a box. Can you believe she sent her to Ohio Valley Wrestling? She put her in a box. Oh, was that? Uh, I think they did. In, I, th- I think they did in WCW too. That was the Spirit Squad when. Uh, they yeah, sent the Spirit them back Squad also to, uh, got sent. They got put in a yeah. box too. Well, here's the thing: when she comes out of that box on TNA Impact, she'll be over. Well, the other thing is they they put her in a box, and then there's a segment later where Wendy's just like pushing this box backstage, and it's like nobody cared. <laughs> like no? nobody's were like. You put someone in a box. Can we, like, get them out of the box? Nope. They were just like, she's just carting a box backstage. They're freaky people. It may not surprise them. Lexus King is getting a shot at the Heritage Cup next week, but he needs a corner man, and he can't find one because no one likes him. And at one point, he goes to Dave, and he goes, can you assign a corner? And she goes, I don't assign corner men. Like, either find one or you don't have one. And then he's a sad sack sap. Man, just nobody likes me. I'm, I'm not they a just, loose cannon. I'm a straight shooter. They don't trust me no more. Yeah, he's Ridge Holland about a year ago. <laughs> Nobody trusts him. I'll say this, though. For as much as there's been a lot of spinning of wheels, they've done a much better job making him Brian Pillman Jr. as Lexus King than he was as Brian Pillman Jr. And we had Cedric and Javon Alvarez <laughs> talking to the writing team. Got a Stephanie Vacure and Julia video package. Both of them, no English whatsoever. They just did subtitles for the entire thing. They did say that they were going to finish off Roxanne and Court Halloween Havoc, and then they were going to be on their way. Like they'd be going to the main roster or something. I don't think that's happening. Shawn Michaels pretty much said, we're going to take it slow because of the language barrier. On their way to the top, winning titles. Rizzo was beat up backstage. So uh, Luca, Crucifino, and Stax had to go out alone. Well, Tony tended to Rizzo. Obafemi absolutely kills Luca Crucifino. Obafemi is a one-man BCC, and I love it. And so afterwards, they, uh, <laughs> afterwards, old uh, uh, can you think Tony of any D. Other acronyms there to describe him? BCC, you idiot. Yeah, I'm just saying. So then they uh, have Tony come out afterwards. He gets zip tied, and then Oba destroys both of the family members in front of Tony. And, man, poor Tony's sad. Trick and Ethan come out for a face-to-face. It was fine. Ethan tried to play it up like, you know, I'm I'm hardcore. I've been all over the world. I bleed. You haven't been through what I've been through. Which, by the way, Trick admits, you're right. I'm pretty lucky. But Ethan has vowed to make him taste his own blood. Not just the blood, but that copper taste. It's like, What? <laughs> Very main roster. This went on seemingly forever, but they did do a good job pushing it along. But it was one of those things that it was set up for X amount of time, and they were going to go through it and get all their lines in, no matter if anybody was sitting on their hands or not. Carmen Petrovich and Sol Ruka had a match built off something earlier where, you know, they're they're actually teasing. They're teasing her about having a crush on Ashanti. So they have a match. Adonis Lee, you didn't like it? And Ashanti comes out and leaves with another blonde from the crowd. So, of course... No graphic for her. Carmen is distracted. Soul hits the soul snatcher. I tried to warn Carmen. This ain't gonna end well. But she's smitten. So, such is life. Then we had my absolute favorite thing on the show. Because it was so profoundly bad. So we got Tyson and Tyreek who I believe for the first time in the history of NXT got a graphic. They're backstage with Nikita Lyons, who has just returned. Okay? Nikita Lyons says the following words, which I swear to God I am not making up. They're meeting backstage, and she says, Look, the lioness is back, and I'm on the prowl. And best believe, after all I've been through, I'm always going to pounce first. I said, (laughs) I got to rewind this a hundred times. And I did. I laughed harder every time. She's trying to get them to look for an opportunity. And suddenly Oba walks up and he gives her her robe. He goes, you dropped this. She says, thank you. He says, no, thank you. Apparently she's going heel. And she is the one who attacked Rizzo. Huh. 
How about that? Then we had OTM versus Hank and Tank. And uh, this NASCAR geek who was on the show for like an hour before they finally announced that he was Cole Custer. He was like such a big fan, they didn't have to tell us who it was. He was in the skit earlier on. We're I know, and they never identified him. In a row. They never identified him. They He's just out name. there. No, they were like, whatever. So anyway, Cole Custer is out there, who, by the way, was very exuberant. I got to give him that. And then at the end, they're doing all these spots. The ref is distracted. He hits one OTM with like a catalytic converter, some car thing. That was his helmet. And then uh, the guy gets pinned. Hank and Tank win. Did you like it? He was at least out there in his gear. And then uh, Lola gets in the ring, and she had Cole Custer shake his hips with her and Hank and Tank. I like this segment. I was entertained. Had a Ridge Holland promo, Tony D promo, all hyping up Halloween Havoc and such. And then the main event was Fallon and JC against Stephanie and Julia, which actually was a pretty good match. And then, uh, you know, they're doing all these spots and everything, and Kalani runs down. You know the most amazing thing about this show was? I'll tell you after the break. But anyway, Kalani runs down, interferes, and uh, hits JC with a headbutt. Julie hits hey, JC with a red butt, uh, headbutt running knee. Stephanie package backbreaker for the pin. And then just like this segment, it's like they're rushing for time. So it's like, spin the wheel. Brrr, ends up on Spinner's Choice. Huh, well, what? Oh, and then here comes, um, what's her face? Zarya. And then it shows off the air. They, they, they got cut off early because they went long. Notice I'm hitting my cue. Observer Live. So the amazing thing about this NXT show is they had Io and Kyrie versus Jakara and Lash. And, like, I always thought that Jakara Jackson was, like, tiny. Just tiny. And they're doing spots with Jakara and Kyrie and Io, and frickin' Jakara towers over them. And it suddenly hit me, she's actually not tiny. She's just... Always standing next to Lash. Lash. <laughs> who's like 15 feet tall. Like, I've been watching Lash and Jakara for months now. And I just thought, like, Jakara's like five feet tall or something like that. No. She's like really tall. And then, you know, they did a segment later on. And, uh, you know, there's a bunch of women backstage. And all of a sudden, um, Kalani walks on screen. <laughs> it's like, is she nine feet tall? And like, she must be wearing gigantic heels or something. And so, you know, I, I uh, you know, the end of the show comes and it's Stephanie and Julia. And then, you know, uh, Kalani ends up getting in the ring with them. And granted, she is wearing heels, but she freaking towers over Stephanie and Julia. I was like, man, this show has totally skewed my perception by like, who they put with who and whatever. You know, Kalani's a gymnast. I figured she's probably five feet tall. No, she's probably like 5'4", five, 5'5". Five, five. And these other two are just tiny. So anyway, it was bizarre watching this show. I mean, it was literally like watching The Hobbit when when Jakar <laughs> is in there with like... I was like, why is she so tall all of a sudden? Is this like forced perspective? No! Anyway. And then, man, when 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 uh, Lash tagged in with Eo and Kyrie, I was like, oh my god. She's like the female great collie. Lash's size and her strength is going to be the biggest attribute she has. If she can obviously come along in the ring as a wrestler, you know, she's going to be around for a long time. We're out of time, everybody. YouTube, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, sign up. 84 shows a month. You won't regret it. I promise. Trust me on this one. We'll talk to you next time. Wrestling Observer Live.